Hello and welcome back to another edition of Simply Serie A, the Italian football podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and I'm delighted to be joined by the brilliant Vittorio Campanile. As always, Vittorio, how are you, my friend? I'm very fine, thanks. I'm very well, thank you, especially after yesterday. Yeah, I can only imagine. Uh, before we get into some of this weekend's games, because there were some really big games in Serie A, there was a lot of movement yep. in the table. Uh, so there's plenty for us to get our teeth into uh, over the next sort of 30 to 40 minutes. But I want to start off by asking you a little bit about the fallout from the Super League, because, of course, the last episode we recorded was when we just heard about it. We were both quite upset about it. We both thought it was it was terrible for the game of football. And since then, We've seen the Super League collapse. What's the mood like in Italy around it? Is this, I know you said to me at the time that there wasn't as big a reaction in Italy as there was here in the UK, but what's the feeling around this whole Super League thing now that the dust has settled? Well, the thing is that all the English club have left, but Juventus is still there, right? And Milan as well. So uh, there is a big interest in here because yesterday, for example, the Italian Federation set up a law that if you are uh, doing a Super League or creating a private league, then you're not allowed to play in Serie A. Uh, just as what uh, UEFA said right last week. So yeah. there's a big question mark. Uh, what's going to happen to Juventus and Milan next year? Are they going to play in the Serie A? Or, or w what's going to happen? Because they're still in. They said that it's not going to start but they still didn't leave. So there's a huge question mark. And unfortunately, here in Italy, we talk a lot about money. And uh, so there, there's a lot of involvement talking about, you know, Juventus' financial balance is awful. And this year is going to be even worse thanks to COVID-19. So uh, the question here people are asking is, OK, uh, where is Juventus going to get the money? The reason why they did the Super League is pretty much that. So they're debating about the money of these clubs, how it's important for this club to get money to don't collapse in a couple of years, more than is it really useful, the Super League, to say football. So uh, there are a lot of question marks, as you as you maybe may know that the Agnelli position is a little bit uh, on hold because there were rumors that uh, inside Juventus, they weren't happy about what he did about the Super League. And uh, so he could. He already left his position in um, in the Italian Federation, obviously, and in UEFA. Now there are question mark that he could leave uh, his position at Juventus because this was a terrible publicity. Let's call it like that for a huge club, very important club like Juventus. So I think still uh, pieces have to fail, and uh, uh, the next weeks will be more important to see what uh, these two clubs that are still in the Super League. Uh, will do. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's still plenty. You feel like this story is not quite dead yet and there's plenty more Definitely to come. Not. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's have a look back at some of the weekend's games. And there were, as I said, uh, some really big games. And one of the big ones in particular was the game between Lazio and Milan. Of course, uh, Lazio running out 3-0 winners. Joaquin Correa with a brace and Chiro Immobile putting the cherry on the top at the end of this one uh, for to, to seal the points for Lazio. It was a really, really big win uh, for Simone Inzaghi's side. And of course, Inzaghi returning to the touchline. Yep after a few weeks out with COVID. How big is this win for Lazio and, and were they deserving of it? Well, it was a final. It was really a final for Lazio. Lazio could only win this match to keep the hope of the Champions League alive. It's still very difficult. Lazio is five points behind, uh, has a match on hold. They have to play against Torino, probably will be playing at half May, so uh, a long time till Lazio recover that match. But really, Lazio had to win this match, and they did. Uh, now, the biggest question mark I have, Harry, is did Lazio win because they played very well or because Milan was terrible? Because, to be honest with you, Lazio lost heavily uh, last week against Napoli, and Napoli is playing amazing football. Uh, Napoli is really uh, playing really, really well. On the other side, Milan is dropping a lot of points. They lost against, against Sassuolo. Now they lost badly against Lazio. So Lazio deserved to win. Now I don't know if we're going to talk about the second goal. I think the ref made a mistake there. But even without that, Lazio probably would have won the match. 
Um, Milan didn't convince me, and we are seeing uh, a huge difference. Last year, beginning of the season, Milan was terrific. They were top of the league. They were scoring a lot of goals, playing great football. Now, in the last couple of months, Milan is really struggling. And uh, Lazio simply took advantage of that. And uh, every time uh, Correa plays against Milan, he's terrific. He scores every time. So uh, that's that's another big advantage for Lazio. But yeah, now the Scudetto race is over, let's be honest. But the Champions League fight is simply amazing because now we have... Atalanta, Napoli, Juventus, Milan, Lazio, all fighting for this. And there are a couple of teams that are playing great football, like Atalanta and Napoli. And other two that probably a couple of weeks ago, we would say they are ready in the Champions League, like Milan and Juventus, that are really struggling. And now there's a big risk that one of, of these two will drop out of the Champions League. Absolutely. And and as you say, it's really hotting up. There's seven points to, that separate second placed Atalanta and Lazio in sixth. So there's plenty to play for. You touched on that second goal that Lazio scored. And I, you know, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, there was there appeared to be a foul on Chalanoglu in the build up to that goal. Uh, Vittorio, for a moment, take your Lazio hat off. Do you think that it should have been pulled back for a foul? Well, even with the Lazio hat on, I, I tend to be very correct. And I thought, seeing the replay, it, it was a foul. And uh, uh has to say that Lazio was really unlucky because at the end of the first half, Lazio scored and the goal was disallowed because an offside that really one millimeter, probably, I don't know. And uh, even the second goal, there is this tackle with, with Leva. It looks like Leva touches the ball, but... For me, it looks like he touched only Chalanoglu. The, the weird thing is that uh, the ref says plays on, allow the goal, then goes back and he's called by the VR, goes and check the VAR. And at that point, for me, it's clear it's a foul, right? Instead, he go back and uh, give Lazio the, the goal. I don't know what happened, honestly. But for me, it, it should have been disallowed, unfortunately, because it's for Lazio. But yeah. Honestly, uh, it would be really interesting to know what Orsado, that was the ref, thought about that. Because if you go and rewatch it, then it's a clear foul for me. Yeah, I, and I agree with you. I've, I've I've seen it, and I agree with you that that it was a foul, and, and Milan can feel uh, very hard done by. But just going back to Milan, because you you talked about the fact that they've struggled in in recent months, and they really, really have. I mean, we were talking about them challenging for the Scudetto earlier in the campaign. Yep. I know. We, in particular, were very cautious about, you know, the, the fact that actually at this moment in time, Milan are overachieving. So Definitely. if they drop off and they still, you know, finish in the top four, I don't think anybody would have, you know, really made an issue of it. But now they find themselves in fifth, Vittorio, because uh, Napoli and Atalanta, as you say, and we'll come on to talk about those in a minute, have really picked up their form. Um but Milan are in danger now of, of missing out on the top four. And if they were to miss out on the top four, I know that's not a long way. Fifth is not a long way from where people expected them to be. But having been in the position they were, it would feel like, a, you know, like a, like they've self-destructed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, yes. I mean, uh, at the beginning of the season, I think all Milan fans would be happier to finish fifth. But now after, you know, you were first... You have been second for very long. I remember Milan fans a couple of weeks ago said, yeah, we, we are safe. And now they're out and they're struggling. And one of the biggest issues I have is that in the second half yesterday, Milan was down and they didn't create a single chance. Um, Ibrahimovic didn't play yesterday. And you can really feel that a number nine is missing there. Manjukic has played the last two matches. But he's not fit. He's not good anymore. Uh, it's not the Mandzukic everybody remembers. Against Lazio, he had a couple of chances in the first half and then pretty much disappeared. And with Ibrahimovic struggling between uh, red cards, injury and lack of performance, because we have to be honest, in the last couple of months, match, month, Ibra didn't play as well as in last year. Uh, and at the moment, Milan doesn't have a backup number nine. They thought Mandzukic could have been there, but we said it in the podcast, right? Yep. Uh, in the last year or so, Mandzukic played like a couple of matches in South Arabia that is not the same level of European football. And you see it. 
he in the second half he was knackered he couldn't run at all and then purely took him off and put in leal leal is a good player but again he's not a number nine he's a winger more than a number nine and in football you can play great football but you have to score at the end of the day if you score you have a chance to win and milan now it's really really struggling to score they have been really lucky against genoa a couple of weeks ago but yesterday they didn't create nothing in the second half so that's the biggest problem not only they are not playing great football but they're lacking a a, a striker that scores yeah absolutely they they're, they're really a shadow of the side that yeah. we saw earlier on in the season and and of course uh, there's it's worrying times for for pioli because he was on the verge of getting ac milan back into the champions league and you felt as though only a huge meltdown would deny them that and it feels as though that meltdown is coming unfortunately um let's move on to to napoli uh, we've mentioned them just sort of briefly in passing and the fact that they've obviously really picked up their form it was a 2-0 win at torino of course torino were in need of the points to as they continue to fight off relegation but for napoli this was all about uh, pushing for the champions league bakayoko and osimen were the goal scorers for Gattuso's side. And, you know, we know that they've been playing very well of late and we know that they've, you know, hit a bit of an upward curve. Uh, just looking, you know, they've only uh, lost one of their last five matches, Napoli, so they are uh, on the right path. But it seemed earlier on in the season that Gattuso was headed for the exit door. And we're now seeing reports this morning that he's reconsidering his position. He's reconsidering uh, the idea of, of potentially staying at Napoli. What's changed for Gattuso? Why has he gone from zero to hero in, in the space of a few weeks? Well, Napoli's form has certainly made a big impact. I think the biggest thing is he got back all his players. Uh, Napoli had a lot of injury uh, during the season. And as we said at the beginning of the season, Napoli could have been a Scudetto contender, especially if you see the team from midfield onwards. They have plenty of options. Bakayoko didn't start in the last couple of months. Now he's starting and he scored. Uh, Merten is back. Osimen is back. Uh, they have Insigne, uh, Politano, and so on. They have plenty of talent there so for me the biggest question mark is why napoli didn't fight for the scudetto because especially the year when juventus is playing badly i thought they had a chance um the problem with napoli is uh, de laurentis is a little bit crazy it's difficult to cope with a owner <laughs> that's like an that. understatement <laughs> i wanted to be nice honestly <laughs> and, and we know that Catuso is a sort of man of honor right so uh if if I think the relationship is quite complicated between De, De Laurentiis and Gattuso. Uh, there were rumors that uh, De Laurentiis could sack Gattuso a, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. Obviously, now it's not possible because me, me, uh, Napoli is playing great football. And if they reach the Champions League, I don't see how De Laurentiis could sack Gattuso. Uh, could Gattuso leave? Yes. But at the moment, I don't think this is possible. Be why? Because I don't think any big team will be looking for a manager. Uh, Conte is safe at Inter. Uh, Inzaghi is not moving from Lazio. Uh, yeah, Pirlo could leave, but I don't think uh, Juventus is thinking about Gattuso. So, you know, I think it makes sense to Gattuso to stay there. And uh, with the Champions League money back, I mean, Napoli could improve this, this team and really fight for the Scudetto next year. Yeah, absolutely. They could indeed. And you mentioned uh, Andrea Pirlo there. And of course, Juve were held to a 1-1 draw uh, at Fiorentina. Uh, there are reports uh, doing the rounds uh, today that and they might have been doing the rounds yesterday as well. But there's, there's reports that he could lose his job uh, if Juventus failed to beat Udinese yep. next weekend. Do you think that Andrea Pirlo is at that point now where it's 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 kind of do or die? Well, the sport director before the match against Fiorentina said uh, Pilo will be our manager if we qualify for the Champions League. So the question mark is what happens if he doesn't qualify for the Champions League, which at the moment could happen because Atalanta and Napoli are flying. So uh, I think if Juventus doesn't reach the Champions League, Pilo is gone. And uh, again, we talked about Agnelli at the beginning of this podcast, and this is another mistake of Andrea Agnelli. Since Agnelli took charge of Juventus, he made a couple of huge mistakes 
and now we see the results. Um, I don't think Andrea Pirlo was ready for Juventus, and he's proving it. Um, Iacchini, the Fiorentina manager, is not one of the best managers uh, in Italy, but won the tactical match against Pirlo, and this tells you that there's a problem there. Uh, Juventus, again, was very lucky, and um, again, I think that Pirlo is not good enough to manage Juventus. He should start from third division, something like that. There have been rumours that Agnelli had a dinner with Allegri. So, uh, for me, Allegri is going to come back to Juventus this summer. Um, I would do it even if Juventus reached the Champions League qualification, in my opinion, because Pirlo simply proved to not be a manager for that level of team. Allegri makes a lot of sense. So, for me, Pirlo has no chance of staying. And the fear I have is that the players know them, know that. And they don't follow the manager anymore, like they did at the, be at the beginning of the season. Yeah, there's only there's only so much a, a great player can sort of take with him as a manager in terms of commanding a respect. When the team see that it's yeah. not working, they lose interest very quickly, don't they? And and for Juventus, it's it's been the case all season. They've been very up and down. They've been very inconsistent, which is something that you wouldn't associate with Juventus over the last 10 years. So to see yeah. them now in this position is obviously... And even the investment of Cristiano Ronaldo is not paying off. He didn't score in the last four matches. He's been uh, uh, struggling a lot. Uh, so, you know, you put a lot of money there. Again, we talked about AC Milan that doesn't have a real number nine without Ibrahimovic. Morata is the only number nine that Juventus has. Um I'm not sure Morata is at the level of Juventus. It's not the right number nine for Juventus. So, you know, they were relying on Cristiano Ronaldo scoring a lot of goals to make up uh, the absence of a real number nine. And now Cristiano Ronaldo is struggling. He's not young. He's getting older. You cannot pretend that he could keep that level up all season long. Um, Dybala has been struggling. So, you see, there are a lot of transfer market mistakes that now are catching up and... Uh, if you add this to a manager that is not good enough, then, you know, it, it, it's difficult. Uh, Milan and Juventus have a tough fixture. They're going to play in a couple of weeks, I think. Uh, yeah, the 9th of May, May there is Juventus-Milan. So, you know, that could be a turning point for both teams. Who lose that match could be out of the Champions League. Yeah, huge game coming up. And, of course, we'll be uh, keeping across that right here on Simply Serie A. Um, Atalanta, they blew away Bologna this weekend. And Atalanta, doing what Atalanta do, basically, which is going out on the field, playing an exciting, enthralling brand of football, absolutely battering their opponents. The goals were from Malinowski, Muriel, Frula, Zapata and Miranchuk. Um, there's nothing I'd like to see more than jean Piero Gasparini qualify for the Champions League again. Because every year, People say Atalanta are going to fall away. They can't yep. possibly maintain this, yet they're doing it. And right now, Vittorio, they sit second in the Serie A. That is some feat. And, and there's just not enough positive things, I don't think, to say about Gasparini and the job he's done at Atalanta. And the thing is, every year we say, you hear people saying they will not, they will not make it this year. And he said they do better because three years ago, they arrived fourth. Last year, third. This year, they will arrive second. I'll tell you now. I'm sure about that. So, you know, they're not only confirming. They're doing better, <laughs> which is simply unbelievable. Um, we talked about money. Atalanta hasn't got the same amount of money of Juventus, Milan, Inter. And they're doing much better than these teams. Well, not Inter this year, but Milan and Juve, definitely. Rome as well. So, um, Muriel... He's playing terrific football. We said that without Gomez, they would lose something. But Zapata and Muriel are making up for the absence of, 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 uh, of Gomez. We have to be say something. Uh, before the first goal of Atalanta, Bologna was playing great football and they wasted so many chances. As soon as Bo Atalanta scored the first, the match was over. They scored another one immediately and Atalanta started dominating the match. Um, Atalanta is a team that plays amazing football. When they attack, they are very dangerous. They can score on different ways, but they allow you uh, a couple of chances uh, every match. But at this point, th they are probably the best team in Italy. They're playing great football. And yeah, I think they will finish, definitely finish second for me.
I'd love to see that. I'd love to see them finish in second. As you say, it would be another step forward, wouldn't it, uh, for Atalanta? Uh, let's move on to the game between Cagliari and Roma. Um, Roma, of course, suffering a 3-2 defeat. A uh, big, big win for Cagliari, who are down at the bottom of the table. They're in 17th place. They're level on points with Benevento, who are in 18th, which is, of course, the last relegation position. So this was a big, big game for Cagliari. Um, you know, they benefited from the fact that Torino lost as well. Uh, which is obviously good for them. Uh, Benevento also losing, of course, as well. But it really feels to me like, and I understand it, but it feels to me like Roma are now all in on the Europa League. And of course, they're in the semi-finals. They take on Manchester United in that. And is that reflected in their performances in the Serie A for you? Definitely, definitely. I think it's the last three matches, at least, we saw this. Um, before... The, the the second leg against Ajax, uh, Fonseca put all the subs in in the in the Serie A match. So um, I think this is a problem. I think this is a big mistake because it's in, on football. You cannot switch off and on when you want. Uh, you have to keep playing to win because if you lose that mentality, now that next Thursday you have to switch it on because you have to beat Manchester United. It could be hard to switch on and think, okay, this match we have to win, the other one we can lose it. So this is a problem. Um, the other thing is putting all your eggs in one basket could be really dangerous. So Roma at the moment are out of the Champions League. Not only losing against Cagliari, now there's a huge risk. They're out of everything if they don't win the Europe League. So, you know, this is a huge risk. On the other side, you're playing against a team like Cagliari that has to win to keep the hope of uh, staying in the Serie A alive. And that's what I think makes the biggest difference in modern football is the mentality, how you play. If you are playing for win or, you know, your head is already uh, to the next match. And that's why Cagliari won against Roma. Uh, and this, again, could be a big risk. Next weekend, there is Benevento Milan. Benevento is fighting for, for avoid relegation. So it's another tough match for Milan. But the relegation fight is really exciting. But I think it's a little bit unlucky that teams like Roma are not focused anymore on, uh, on Serie A because like this, Cagliari that maybe could have lost against Roma, they won quite easily. And uh, now they're, you know, not safe, but they got three very, very important points. Absolutely, they did indeed. It's a massive three points uh, for Cagliari. Let's uh, just briefly... Uh, touch on Inter. I'm just, you know, we talk a lot about Inter on the show and, and that's why I wanted to start with the other sides. But it was a typical Antonio Conte uh, game, wasn't it? You know, leaving yeah. it quite late and, and, and nicking the goal uh, and, and being resolute, if not brilliant. Yes, Verona is a little bit like Atalanta, I would say, uh, with less talent. But Juric, the manager, has the same mentality, the same type of football football of Gasperini and you can see it every time they play uh, so Verona put Inter in a lot of pressure uh, there have been a lot of rumors here in Italy about the goal that they disallowed uh, to Verona uh, they say it wasn't a foul basically Handanovic went out to grab the ball uh, he had a tackle he was pushed a little bit with Faraone uh, the, the Verona winger and uh, the ball went in and the ref said uh, after VR, he cancelled the goal. I'm not sure about that, but this tells you that Verona put uh, Inter in danger. Uh, Inter is not playing great football, but to score against them is quite complicated. It's really, really hard. Even though Andanovic, we have to say, is not playing at his best. Uh, yeah. I think this, this summer Inter probably will look for a better goalkeeper because... Handanovic made a couple of mistakes this season. I remember last week against Napoli, uh, again against Verona, he wasn't perfect. But still, uh, Inter has so many quality players that can decide the match. Uh, so, and especially uh, seeing that your opponent, I'm thinking about Juventus and Milan, that was the team that should have been fighting with Inter for the Scudetto, are <laughs> struggling. This gives you extra energy. So that's why I think Inter is winning because they're seeing that the other teams are struggling. This gives you extra boost and they find a way to win. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Inter taking another big step uh, towards the Scudetto, their first one 
in over a decade it won't if well it's not if anymore it's when they get over the line Uh, let's quickly round up the results from week 33 Uh, Atalanta 5 Bologna 0 Benevente 2 Udinese 4 Cagliari 3 Roma 2 Fiorentina 1 Juventus 1 Genoa 2 Spezia 0 Inter 1 Verona 0 Lazio 3 Milan 0 Parma 3 Crotone 4 Sassuolo 1 Sampdoria 0 Torino 0 Napoli two. Just before we go, Vittorio, Palmer are just oh the God. most unluckiest team in the world. It, it kills me because I've got a soft spot for Palmer. And when you see, you know, the way that they things have sort of panned out for them in the last few weeks, you can't help but feel pain for them. Oh, yeah. It, it's unbelievable, really. You know, in football, there are, there are those type of years that, you can do anything and still you're going to lose. And this is what happened with Parma. They they go ahead 2-0, they lose 3-2. They go ahead 3-0, they lose 4-3 at the last second. You know, it's simply unbelievable. Again, we said it so often. This team is not that bad. They shouldn't be there. Instead, they're going down this year. There's nothing to do. And every week, they find a new way to lose. Uh, they change manager. It didn't help. They play great football and then... They are disaster in defense. Um, I don't know what to say. It's simply, <laughs> it's simply unbelievable. Uh, I'm wondering if you are going to talk about Serie B next year, so you are able to talk about Parma. Yeah, but maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> we'll change the name of the podcast. It's simply Serie A slash B. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Crotone, it's another team fighting for relegation. Uh, they are tough to beat. But, you know, again, Parma find new way to lose and... Uh, uh, Daversa changed a little bit the lineup. Um, uh, Gervinho didn't start, uh, then he came in, he scored, etc. And still, they find a way to lose. And I think they have no chance at the moment, so yeah, no, they're, they're gone for me. But my yeah. heart hurts every time I see them turning these performances where they score goals, but then they just undo it all at the back. So, yeah, uh, disappointing to see. But of course, uh, we move forward and we're going to be back with another show, uh, perhaps later on in the week. Uh, so uh, make sure you uh, all stay safe. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. If you're new, make sure you smash the like button uh, as well. Leave us a review uh, if you could and make sure you give Vittorio a follow as well. I'll leave his uh, thing His handle, I should say, in the description. Vittorio, how can people find the Lazio Lounge podcast? Well, you can follow Lazio Lounge on Twitter, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. You just type Lazio Lounge and, uh, you know, every time Lazio play, there is a new podcast. There you go. Make sure you head over and check it out. And I'm sure you'd have catched, uh, you'd have caught Vittorio in a very good mood on the one (laughs) following yesterday's game. We'll be back very, very soon with more Simply Serie A. Until then, take care. Ciao.